John chapter Jesus being divine. We had a lot of visitors with us today. And that's always good to have that many visitors and such. Uh, one visitor we have in our class, Patricia Barlow. I'd uh, take a chance, opportunity to meet her. She but you live in Benton. Awesome. Well, we're glad to have you with us today. Yep. You have a daughter? Do you have another child too? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, we're glad you're here. As far as announcements, um, what other announcements? Daryl Thompson's son, he's an elder at Union Hill. Okay. Josh is his son. Paulette Thompson used to be. Okay. What else? These are this next week. They'll begin tonight, and I think they'll go through Friday. Friday ish, something like that. So that'll be going on. I'll be in and out of town for that. I think I'm speaking Thursday. I probably ought to find that out. <laughs> All right. This is a John's Gospel. Number one, well, this comes from even that by believing you may have life in his name. Okay. What are the two purposes? To prove to you what? Jesus is the Christ. Secondly, to cause you to act. It's not enough to know, but you have to know and to do. Now, Jesus here gives one, or analogies, I guess it would be, as well as a parable, that a lot of people have messed up because well, we want to follow just what the Bible says. Let's go ahead and read it. John chapter 15, we'll begin in verse 1. I am the vine, my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in a vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He has fruit, for without me, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. But I mentioned sometimes that people will uh, take applications from this, which I think are foreign to Scripture. That you run is that each one of the vines here or each one of the <laughs> in that kind of church in this kind of church they're all going to Jesus in their own way or their own many roads which lead to heaven now is that what Jesus churches Who's he talking about? Christians. Christians, individuals. Each one of us are individually rooted within Christ. He's not talking about churches. Secondly, if he was talking about churches, each one of these churches would have to be based on Christ and Christ's uh, teachings, right? <laughs> now, can you follow Christ's teachings and be a denomination? Can you? Because the definition of a denomination is one of many. So they have to be different in the way in which they teach salvation. Some people get voted in. Some people say a prayer in. Some people get tongues and come in. Some people just get chosen or born in, whatever it may be. How are we added to the Lord's church? 
Okay, by our salvation. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. When a man follows the gospel plan of salvation, he is added to the Lord's church. The act of worship, right? have contemporary worship. Some churches church. Some churches have a choir. An organist, all these different things. What are we to base our worship on? Bible teaches. Don't go beyond what Scripture teaches, and don't leave out. In Christ, that church is because there's only one church, right? Ephesians chapter four, verses four through six. All right. So let's go ahead and run through this. Who is the vine? The vine is Jesus. Now, of course, uh, there's a lot of tradition about where this is at. A lot of people put this right outside the gate of Jerusalem. One of the gates, there's 15 gates. And the gate that leads to the, um, guard, to the Mountain of Olives where uh, Jesus did his prayer, it is covered with vines. It is covered with statuary and also probably back at that time, real vines. And so very likely... Jesus is standing right next to this huge vine, and he's pointing, and he's pointing. Who is the vine? The root. Life from being a part of that trunk. Your trees. Those trees come off unless you root them or whatever else you may do individually. Once they're cut off of that trunk, they're dead. Now, some die quicker, some die slower, but there's no hope. They're gone. And that's what Jesus is saying here. The vine or the uh, source of all life is Christ. That's something we have to remember. And something I think so often, I don't know if we forget intellectually, but we forget heart-wise. Because you and I live among what's called the living dead. People who are dead in their sins, people who have no hope, people who are lost. And yet, how often does our heart go out for the people that we know who are lost? How often do we really thinking about how they need the gospel? Or are we instead just going about our own life? All right, so the vine dresser is God. It is God that adds you to the church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. You don't join a church. You have to be added to the church. He is the one that adds you. And according to Revelation chapter 2, he is the one that takes you out. Uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2. He puts you in the days, right? I put you in this world, I can take you out. God's the one that puts you in a church, and God is the one that takes you out of the church as well. So he is the vine dresser. In other words, it's his responsibility to decorate and to shape the vine the way he wants it to go. You ever see people who really know what they're doing as they're trimming a tree? And it's pretty interesting seeing that. When I trim a tree, it's going to look like that bush right there. Just kind of going everywhere. Probably 15 years ago, that bush looked really good. But you see how there's branches which go here and branches which go there and all this other stuff. Um, last year, he was talking about Travis, uh, Travis Terrell, who works with us, uh, about uh, working on the um, and, uh, you know, hadn't produced them forever. And uh, the guy was telling me, he talked to Travis, and Travis said, well, when the branches cross or something like that, they won't produce in the correct way. I don't know if Travis is just telling them something or not, because I don't know anything about trees. But yeah, I was like, whatever, you know. But Travis knows how to fix a tree, because he has a lot of experience and loves working on things like that. Well, that's what God is. God is the one who designs a church. We think we designed a church, right? Man, a church would be so much better if this doctrine is this way, or we'd be more inclusive if we did this or that or whatever else. Who gets God does. It's He's the one who put the church together, so he is the vine dresser, okay? 
Now the branches that lead off of the trunk or the vine, they are Christians, not different individual denominational churches. They are Christians. All right? They are connected. John chapter 14 to verse 6, Jesus says what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but yeah, but by me. You got to go through Christ to get to the Father. Now there's a lot of people today that believe spiritually you can cut off a branch and just leave it over here, not root just fine. They don't realize the life-giving force, the spiritual life is connected to that trunk, connected to that part. And so that's something which is very important for us to remember. All right, now number four. Number four is a really tricky one. A lot of times when we get confused on this one, it's because of number four. Okay? How shall, well, it should be verse eight. I should have written down there instead of verse nine. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much what? Fruit. Okay. Now what is Fruit. Any other choices as to what fruit would be? And those are good choices. A lot of times people come across and say, well, a fruit is Christians, right? The whole purpose of fruit, at least biologically, is to produce more plants, right? The reason corn has corn is so you can create more corn plants. The reason an apple has apples is so you can produce more apple trees. Same with everything else, watermelon, whatever else it may be. Biologically, that's the purpose, is to create more of those things. But it's not the only purpose. God created fruit not only to produce more fruit trees, but also to feed folks, right? So fruit has more than just one purpose. Well, let's keep thinking about that, and let's go to the end, uh, do uh, the way which Plato used to do his, uh, his uh, philosophies. Start at the end and work our way back. If fruit is making more Christians... And that's the way in which we should. What's that say about each one of us in order to get to heaven? That means in order for, get, for us to get to heaven, every single individual one of us would have to do what? Bring somebody else to Christ. Now, while that would be, would be awesome if every single one of us did, is that a requirement which God has placed upon us? We're commanded to go and teach, Right? But are each one of us individually commanded that we must convert somebody if we get to heaven, if we're going to get to heaven? No, no. And so our fruit, yes, biologically, our fruit, spiritually speaking, will bring other people into the Lord's church, will reproduce in that way. The fruit that Jesus is mean that, but it means good works, as was mentioned over here. Believe me, I'm married. Joking. Um, what works show that we're Christians? Our love for one another, our following of the doctrine and commandments. A fruit has certain ways, right? Pretty much. Took my Boy Scout troop last weekend. Real Foot Lake down in Tennessee. Other stuff around the cypress trees. Beautiful place. Well, we were going along, and as we were uh, moving, uh, one of the boys was walking along. There were 12-year-olds. Yeah. All right, so we were walking along, and suddenly a beagle shows up. And, you know, he's laughing, and, you know, all the boys have to pet the beagle. Well, the beagle has a radio collar. A little bit later, another beagle shows up. A little later, another beagle shows up. So I tell the boy, sit, be still. I said, a guy with a gun is about to come over the hill. We do not want to get shot. And so we all sat down and waited, and all these dogs were here. And eventually, what do you know? Here comes the guy over the hill. He's like, hey, you know. Rabbits. Did not ask if he was Elmer Fudd, but he did look like it. But uh, he was hunting rabbits. And so we talked about rabbits and everything else and made jokes about the cartoons which do not work with 12-year-olds because they've never seen Elmer Fudd. Bless their hearts. 
But um, we went back and forth with that and everything else. Now, beagles are interesting because not only is there a bark, but they're able to smell. Very Rabbits, uh, coons, possums, things like that. Although nobody in their right mind to hope would ever hunt a possum. But they're great at hunting those sort of things. Uh, you go out to the prison here. Sounds great as. Great to do. It's the only animal that can uh, testify in court. Uh, is a bloodhound. They can testify in court by recognizing smells and things such as that. It's one of those unique legal things that uh, is true in our country. All right, what's another dog that has a specific um, specific uh, trait? Yes, German Shepherd. Okay, German Shepherds are great as guard dogs and great as attack dogs. What else over here? Service dogs. Um, what, what's the type of dog that Kaiser has? Not a snickerdoodle. That's a candy bar. Golden doodle. That's what it is. It's a golden doodle. Snickerdoodle's a cookie, right? Yeah, yeah a golden doodle's a dog. Don't eat a golden doodle. Stick with the snickerdoodles. All right. All right. They're great because their hair, they have hair, not fur, hypoallergenic, and plus their smell, they can be trained to actually recognize a person's blood sugar and a specific person's blood sugar. And so when a blood sugar drops, that dog alerts, and they know, hey, we need to add some insulin. We need to do something in this situation. All right, that's what's neat about dog breeds, and I'm actually going somewhere with this, is you can identify a certain kind of dog by its characteristics, which it has. It's saying here, when he is pointing out this vine that's going across the temple wall, or the city wall, is he's identifying, hey, this is what's represented. When you are connected to the vine, which is Jesus Christ, then you are going to produce this kind of fruit. A Christian has certain traits which appear and which show. Now, let's think that over. In, in a sense, we're changing analogies, but since we're not. Galatians 5, 22-23, Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, Gentleness. If you've got the Spirit in you, that's the fruit you produce. Now, in your life, if you don't have joy, if you don't have peace, if you don't have self control, you're not rooted firmly in what the fruit looks like. You're saying the image of God. Yes. The emotion that man has. Yes, sir. Right, right. Right. It's the uh, it's the spirit of God. It's the spirit of God. Absolutely, the spirit of God which is there. Good point. Good point. Now, there's some fun stuff here as well. Uh, progression of life is seen. You see that in verse two and verse five. You bear fruit, then you bear more fruit, and then you bear much fruit. Now, how does that apply to us? Can you bear fruit just for a season and then be done? And much fruit. You have, it's a continual process that goes along. It's one of the a Christian, you don't just produce a fruit your entire life. Whether you're 80, whether you're 70, whether you're 50, whether you're 30, you've got to be bearing fruit. And, of course, the source of our productivity is Jesus Christ. Something I think is interesting here. I don't have it on my notes here, but I want to cover it. Look at verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he does what? He takes it away. In other words, you can lose your salvation by not bearing fruit. You ever have a garden? What do you got to do to that garden? Once the that is the bummer part of having a garden. I love laying the garden out. I love planting and I love harvesting. 
but it's those three months in the middle I don't like, you know? It's those weeds that show up, and you got to get out there and hoe. And I thought all my life, man, I'm just going to have some kids and make them do all the work. i got teenagers. It's not happening yet, right? They look at me, and they're like, you know? So it's one of those interesting things that goes through. Or God takes us out. Fruit, you're cut off. You're no longer in Christ. Now, if you do produce fruit, and tell me what this means, okay? Every branch that does produce fruit, he prunes that it may produce more fruit. Now, what's that mean? You prune a tree, you prune a tomato plant, you prune certain plants so they produce more fruit. What's that mean for us? It doesn't mean we're cut off because that's what happens if you don't produce fruit. He says, if you do produce fruit, I'm going to prune you so you can produce more. What's that mean? Take out some of the undesirable. Okay. All right. He takes out the un undesirable parts of me. All right. I'm a Christian. And in my life, I've got good things happening. Right? Because I'm trying to produce fruit. I'm trying to show love and joy and peace. I'm trying to produce those things. But since I'm a mortal Christian... There are parts of my life that are not where they need to be. Maybe I need to pray more. Maybe I need to read my Bible more. Maybe I need to learn to forgive other people better. Okay, there are things which are there. Now, as I continue to, as I continue to read his word and let his spirit dwell in me, as I continue to practice godliness, those bad parts of my life will prune away. Now, pruning sometimes hurts. And sometimes there's parts of my life I don't want there, but as God prunes in my life and as I take those things out, it helps me to be a better Christian. I don't know, is that a pretty good explanation? Do y'all have a better one for pruning? What you got, Sonny? Okay. All right. Okay, Marilyn? Yeah, like if you take out a branch that's, that's not doing well and you cut it, it causes the sap to go to that first one and produce even more. And sometimes it causes other branches to appear. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. I know with uh, tomatoes and some other plants which you grow, a lot of times you'll cut off the suckers or you'll cut off some branches which aren't producing so that more of the sap or more of the life-giving uh, nutrients will go to places that need to work. Plants, by the way. I just know that theoretically they're supposed to be watered every once in a while. You ever cover tobacco with no worries? Ah, yes. Yes. Tobacco is, I guess, maybe the most labor-intensive pro product that's there. You have to sucker it, then you have to, what, chop it? And then, you, then you strip it, and smoke it. I, I don't know. I just had somebody tell me when I first moved here. I think it was Gene Gillowan said, when you see the barn burning, don't tell anybody. <laughs> and uh, I think that has stuck with him forever. And so anytime I see somebody's house burning, I just turn my nose and keep driving. I'm awfully labor intensive. That's right. All right, what are some other examples about pruning or things you had to talk about pruning? All right, we've cut all that part out. Okay, now uh, in 11 verses of John, the word abide is used 11 times. All right, what's it mean to abide? Oh, abide with me, fast falls the even tide. What's abide mean? means to stay in a certain place, right? You know, I abide in my home. I abide in this church. And so what Jesus is saying here is we need to remain in him. Now, if, if he's commanding us to remain in him, is it possible to not be in Christ, to leave? Sure it is. Now, you'll meet denominational folks. A lot of people believe in this doctrine of once saved, always saved. And what they'll do is they'll be quoting the fire out of the book of John. 
And in response, we'll be quoting a fire out of the book of Hebrews. And a lot of people who don't study very deeply think that John and Hebrews must contradict in some way. John, especially 1 John as well, and talk about how if you're in Christ, you cannot be taken away. Nobody can snatch you from the Father's hand. Now, first of all, if you notice the Greek of it, which we don't always go into the Greek, it's a continual action where we have to continually stay. So it is possible to leave the Lord. Now, we don't want you to leave the Lord, but we're warned that we need to stay in not a one-time accomplishment. We always have to abide in Christ. Now, that's doctrinally speaking, practically speaking. Why is it important that we remember that we are to abide in Christ? We reach a goal sometimes, what we tend to do. Forget about it, right? Yeah. Uh, we are year you get down to that 10 pound mark what usually happens you celebrate and go get some ice cream right you go to the buffet and life is good again and guess what happens it comes right back now a lot of times you will you will study the gospel with somebody and it happens here sadly to say sometimes because it happens everywhere we'll find a person in the world and we will share Jesus with him Show them the love of God's people, and they will obey the word of God. And they will be baptized for the remission of their sins, and they will obey the gospel. When they come out of that water, they are saved. Is there still the pull of the world and all their old habits? That's going to be right there. Now, they have to continue to abide. And it's a hard thing to stay faithful to God when that pull is still there. It's... It's not just an addiction, but it acts like an addiction, pulling you back to your old habits, pulling you back to your old ways. And so when you convert somebody to Christ, especially somebody who is really deeply involved in the world, it's really hard to keep them. Now, practically speaking, for us, many of us in this room have been members of the Lord's Church for a good while. When we obey the gospel, we need to remember, I've got to stay faithful. I've got to really concentrate. I've got to continually allow God to prune out those parts of my life which are in the way. Loved us. Let's go ahead and read that. Nine. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. You need to abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You that your joy may remain in you, and that this commandment that you love one another, this is my commandment, that you love one another. They lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. I no longer call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends for all things I've heard from my Father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. All right. And so, love one another, which is here. We love one another even as Christ has loved us. I should say John 15, 12, rather than 12, 2. And so I went through here writing down some things. What, was, what does it mean to love as Christ has loved us? Well, we spend a lot of time going through the different words for love, right? Agape, phileo, eros, storge, things such as that. And that uh, sometimes that's profitable, sometimes not so much. But I think it's important to look at the Jesus' love is sacrificial, right? His life, his place in heaven, he not only made himself a man, but he died. He not only died, he died on the cross. Now, if my love needs to reflect his love, 
That means that I need to love a person even sacrificially. Now, what, how, do you, how can you love somebody sacrificially? In the church. Are we commanded just to love our friends? No. Friends and whom? Enemies, right? Somebody talks about me in a bad way. What's my job? Love them anyway and show them grace. Somebody is just obnoxious and hard to be around. What's my job? Got to love them anyway. And you say, well, they don't deserve it. Did Christ die for us when we deserved it? Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says what? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, Jesus' love is intimate, all right? As Jesus loves the Father, you know your parents, you know your kids better than anyone else, right? You know your parents because you see them around the house. You see them when they're guarded and when they're unguarded. You see your kids, and you know more about your kids than anybody else, which scares them to death, right? The same way, our love for God and for one another has to be intimate. We have to know each other well. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the children of God. Okay? Jesus' love is initiating. What do I mean by the word initiate? It means self-starting. Okay? Not worrying about everything else. Now, think about friendliness. He who wishes to have friends must first be what? Friendly. A lot of people will come into a church, they'll sit on a certain row over here all by themselves, not talk to anybody or anything else, wait till the services are over, or even before services are over, walk right out, and then they'll say, man, that's not a very friendly congregation. All right? Well, what's the problem? You've got to initiate you have to self-start in order to have friends. All right? How's that refer to us in the church? A lot of times people are not active in the Lord's church. They're just pew sitters. I used to have an African-American preacher down in Mississippi who said he hated pew potatoes because he said, Lord listens to him and goes, pew. Although I think he would smell them. But anyway, it worked a lot better for him than me too when he t- said that story. He'd talk about pew potatoes because they're pew. They don't smell good at all. A lot of people are pew potatoes because they're not self-starters. They wait for somebody to come find them and say, okay, here's your job. Here's what we need you to do. They wait for somebody to tell them and to force them, all right, this is what's going to happen. Now, our love needs to be initiating. Do you need to wait for somebody to show you love before you can show love back? If we all wait around, what's going to happen? Nobody will do it, right? Right? You've got to initiate and got to help other people. That's why Romans 5, 8 is there. Jesus loved us before we loved him. And that's the reason we have this beautiful and wonderful relationship. Secondly, Jesus' love is productive. It's productive. Look there in verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you that there may be fruit. That fruit which is there. We have to produce fruit. There has to be purpose. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about the resurrection. If Christ did not raise, we are of all people to be the most pity. What Paul puts forth in 1 Corinthians 15 is the reason that you and I are Christians. Now, is Christianity the best life? Sure it is. It's the best way to live. It's the most productive. You'll be happier as a Christian than anything else. But that's not why we're Christians. We're Christians because of what we get out of it. Christ is raised, which means we will be raised. Christ endured temptation, was raised by God, which means when we endure temptation, we also shall be helped and saved by God. There is a productive element to it. Now, let's each one of us examine our lives, and I want us to ask ourselves, how productive am I for God? Now, Once again, it doesn't mean that we have to bring other people to Christ. Although we're commanded to teach, productivity means your Christian works. It means that fruit of the Spirit which is in your life. Over this past week, if the gardener were to come, which is God, of where I was at work, uh, the productivity that I've had, what would he say about my life? 
Would he say, man, totally unproductive, we just need to get rid of that and find someone who will use that sap in a better way, use that life-giving energy in a better way? Or would he look at me and he'd say, okay, you know, this man, this lady is working really well. I'm going to prune out some parts so they can produce more. But they are using God's gifts in a beneficial way. kind of fruit are we producing? What parts of our lives need to be pruned? What parts of our lives need to flourish a little bit more in order to be faithful to Him? In order for us to be living the way that we need to be living? Well, how would God consider us when He looked at us and saw the life that we are living? And that's kind of a thought-provoking question when we look at it. Uh, there is a Politically speaking, socially speaking, there's a buzzword going around right now. And that word is white privilege. Have you heard that word? And it's a buzzword, which is coming out of the uh, Black Lives Matter sort of business, uh, out of that movement, saying, okay, white people are placed in a certain spot. They're given certain rights. They're given certain things in society. Some of it's true. Some of it I'm not so sure about sometimes. But let's look at that from that perspective of our spiritual life. Because that political thing, we could argue about that forever, one way or the other. Look at it spiritually. When God created this world, began it spinning, and when he got us here in 2016, it still feels weird for me to say 2016. He put the wealthiest people in the world, mostly in one country. And what country? It's ours. Now, there's getting to be a lot of millionaires and billionaires in some other countries. And our net worth is going down. When God began spinning this world, and he's looking at it 2016, in which country is the Lord's church the strongest? It's still right here, isn't it? And when God created this world and got it spinning in 2016, okay, one of the awesome things about Marshall County is that over 10% of all the residents here are members of the Lord's church. You compare us to anywhere else in this country, the only places that even come close is northeast Alabama and some areas around Nashville. But we are third, maybe a strong second, anywhere in this country as far as numbers or percentages of people who are members of the Lord's Church. So if you grow up in Marshall County, you have a better opportunity to get to heaven than you would anywhere else in the world. That's kind of cool, isn't it? God gave me that by letting me live here. And God gave you that by letting you live here. What fruit are you producing in return for that awesome blessing? When I went to Russia, I guess it was 15 years ago, I went there for about a month on a little short-term mission trip. Really interesting. I'll never forget my translator. Translators always add a lot whenever you're talking. And so I learned a little Russian, just enough to know that was not what I said. But one thing that he said, I asked him about it afterwards. At the end of one of my lessons, I was talking about how glad I was to be there to be a missionary and everything else. And what he told the people in the congregation was, you people, I don't think he said y'all because he was Russian, that's only Southern. He said, you people need to really listen to what this man teaches. Because there will come a day when your children need to become missionaries and go back to the United States and begin to convert them. And that's what he would bring up at the end of every lesson. Now I thought, man, that is silly. But you know, there's probably some truth to that. Looking at what's happening in churches in different places, God, through his providence, creates places of strength so that they can create another place of strength as nations rise and fall, right? Acts 17 Daniel 2, Daniel 7, you know, we see where God is operating in the rise and fall of nations. And I think that's super interesting as we look at it. But look at your life. God has blessed you a lot if you live here. And so to whom much is given, much is required. We are the five talent Christians. Remember the five, two, and a one? We have definitely got the five talent. All right, as you close the book or close the chapter and you go through here, down through verse 27... We don't have enough time necessarily to read it. But Jesus talks about persecution. He says, you know, the world's going to hate you. The world hated me first. The world is absolutely 
going to hate you as well. And I've written down on our little sheet many of the accusations, and we see this in uh, secular history. What people said about the church and why they hated the church. What did they say? First of all, Christians are atheists. Now, you and I think today that's the silliest thing ever. But these people would look at Christians and they'd no longer go to the temples. They'd no longer offer sacrifices to the emperor. They didn't believe in God, so they're called atheists. Uh, they're called arsonists because they're always talking about what burning up? The world. Yes, sir, Bob. The spirit rules the inspired word. Absolutely it does. When you talk about the spirit proving the inspired word, you're talking about how God works through us and how it shows that God's word is correct in the way in which it needs to go. Absolutely. Number three, the church is a bunch of home wreckers. Okay? You got to love the Lord more than you love your husband, wife, and children. People took that and took it out of context. Number four, cannibals. Where did they get cannibals from? These people were showing up on Sunday, and what were they doing in the dark? Eating flesh and blood, right? Okay, number five, they're immoral because they continue to teach against the... We laugh at that and say it's silly because people took half measures of that and, you know, kind of came up with their own thing. But today, people look at Christians from a worldly perspective. Do they see us as immoral? What do we say about homosexuality? The practice of homosexuality. It's wrong. That is intolerant. And according to many people, the governor of New York this last week, that is hate speech. That is hateful to say, right? And as a matter of fact, you start going through every one of these, you start seeing a return back to what the world thinks about the church. It's kind of interesting as you run across that. But what lesson does that teach us? Do we judge our success by what the world says? You better not, because they're running towards the wrong goal, right? You ever see in football or even basketball where people shoot in the wrong hoop? Think one of the actually has made three scores against himself. A rebound, and he keeps tipping that ball, and bless his heart, the ball goes into the wrong hoop when he tips it. A lot of people in this world are headed towards the wrong goal in the wrong way. All right, thank you for being here. We'll meet again tonight, what, 5 o'clock? Meet again tonight at 5 o'clock.